All right. So today we are lucky to have Christina Gross um, coming to us and talking about working with native survivors. So um, I love this presentation. I've seen it, uh, you know, a bunch of times. I respect Christina, love Christina, <laughs> and y'all are in for a you're all in for a treat. So um, let's go through some of the housekeeping stuff, kind of show you how to use the platform, kind of what we're gonna use on the platform features and stuff. And then uh, we'll get uh, right into it, friends. Um, as always, um, the work that we do at the Utah Domestic Violence Coalition is uh, mostly funded by federal grants through the Office of Violence Against Women. So, um, I'm sure you have used the Zoom interface <laughs> before. Um, I'm sure many of you um, use it several times a day. <laughs> so um, this is, you know, the, the, the features that we're going to use for today's webinar. And um, this is what your screen should kind of look like. Um, the first option that we have here is the Q&A. Um, so you can click this Q&A button um, and you can send me uh, a question. Um, you can also click to do it anonymously. Um, even if you send it, um, you know, without it being anonymous, excuse me, I will not say your name. So um, either way, um, but yeah, you can send a question that way. And I can ask Christina the question throughout the, the webinar. Um, if I know she's going to cover it, then I won't ask the question. So keep that in mind. Um, you can raise your hand. Um, this button will be used if Christina or, or I ask a question um, about, you know, something like, hey, um, how many of you love Utah winters? And everyone raises their hand, right? Um, so that's uh, kind of, we'll use that to get like consensus from the, the audience. And then next is the chat feature. So this is the one that we'll probably utilize the most. So if you have questions, you can also type them into chat. Um, and I will be monitoring chat throughout um, this webinar for Christina. So how about everyone try the chat feature right now? Um, click that chat button and you can change who you want the chats to be sent to. So you can click this drop down button or drop down menu and change it from all panelists to all panelists and all attendees. And um, tell us who you are, where are you from? Are you a, a system advocate? Are you um, a social worker? Um, do we, usually we have folks um, here from DCFS. We have a lot of LCSWs that attend. Um, so who, who are you, where are you from? All right, so we have some community-based advocates who are joining us, excellent. Um, we have some social workers, looks like we have some medical um, social workers. Um, and it's to the point where I recognize a lot of the names because <laughs> y'all have been on the webinars with us uh, so frequently, which I love. Um, okay, so we have some therapists, we have legal advocates, nice, nice, nice. Um, we have uh, some system advocates um, for the state. Ooh, we have um, uh, some social workers from um, down south in the Four Corners area, nice, nice. So we have a, a, a great mix of folks here today. Um, thank you everyone for, for, for doing that. Um, ooh, it looks like we've got some folks from Adult Protective Services. Nice, nice, nice. Okay, thank you everyone. And um, it, go ahead and ask questions, um, comments, stuff like that throughout the presentation. I will be monitoring that and giving that uh, information to Christina as we go along. All right, so <laughs> I know I know this is a big reason why you, you join us each week is because I offer free CEUs. <laughs> well, this week is just like the rest, um, but this week you get 1.5 hours of CEUs. So um, we have been having some trouble with Zoom sending the links to everyone. So I will personally do that right after this webinar. Um, so you can take that um, quiz and then I can send you your certificate. So real quick, um, who the Utah Domestic Violence Coalition is. So we are the federally recognized state anti-domestic violence co coalition for the state of Utah. So each state and territory has a coalition. Um, 
they also have a sexual um, violence coalition. Some states are together, um, dual coalitions, and some states are separate. And Utah just happens to be a separate state. So it's about half and half that uh, um, do it uh, either way. So we um, are a support organization. So we support those who serve um, victims and survivors directly through education, outreach, training, and technical assistance. Um, so if you have a question, you need support, call us. That's our job. That's why we're here. Um, and we um, hopefully can link you with some resources. And then uh, lastly, um, you will hear from me throughout the webinar, of course. I will be supporting Christina if you have any questions. Again, I'll be monitoring chat. Um, but I am the voice that you've heard week to week um, throughout our webinar series. So I am Andy Tremonti. I use they, them, their pronouns. And I'm the education and outreach coordinator for the coalition. Um, and so I'm over all the, the education and training that the coalition offers. So yeah, any questions, reach out um, into chat and Christine, are you ready to share your screen and, and rock this? Okay, I'm gonna hand it over to you. I'm gonna stop sharing. Looks great. Um, earlier this morning, we had a problem with my computer that Andy had to troubleshoot. So I think we're okay now. It looks great. And I'm glad that we were able to troubleshoot that. <laughs> okay, um, all right. So um, my presentation is titled Violence Against Native People. Um, it's not a Native tradition. Uh, however, a lot of the, the content is really going to be focused on women, you know, unfortunately in our community as well as the community at large, um, a lot of the research really looks at um, violence against women. Um, so I've, I've tried to include a little bit um, of information that there is um, about Native American people, but like I mentioned, the, the bulk of my com uh, presentation will be focused on women. All right. So um, just by way of introduction, Mike. Um, it means hello in Ute. Um, I'm an enrolled member of the Ute Indian tribe. I'm also part Hopi and also part Chinese on my mother's side. Um, I grew up in the city though. I've lived in the city for most of my life. I did live on the reservation, although it was not um, my family's reservations. We lived as when I was a kid on the, in the Zuni reservation in New Mexico for a couple of years. Um, my education background, I have a bachelor of science and a master of social work from the University of Utah. Um, between my bachelor's degree and my master's degree, I worked um, as a CPS worker on a domestic violence team. Um, DCFS does not have domestic violence teams anymore, but it was a really great um, learning experience for me. So the majority of the, uh, the abuse or neglect that I investigated was domestic violence. However, we did take cases, all kinds of um, abuse and neglect cases in the Valley. Um, and it was very interesting work. It was really my first work into looking at um, how domestic violence affects families, um, you know, children, adults, um, and trying to figure out how to help support these families that were dealing with some of these issues and try to get some, some intervention and some resources to these families. Um, after I, well, during my uh, master's program until presently, um, I, did my second year internship at the Urban Indian Center. It was called the Indian Walking Center at the time. Um, so I've been an intern, I've been a contractor, and I've been a therapist um, in the behavioral health program, in the health program. I worked in the health program for five years um, and then came back to uh, the Red Mesa. Um, we also had a na name change in our behavioral health program. So it's Red Mesa Behavioral Health now. Um, and at, about a year ago, I became the director for the behavioral health program. So. Okay, so today we're gonna learn a little bit about the risks that Native American women, men, and Two-Spirit people face um, regarding sexual assault and other kinds of violence. We're gonna learn a little bit about the unique issues that contribute to sexual assault and other violence in Native American populations, uh, both on the reservation. I'll talk a little bit about the reservation and a little bit about the urban areas. My work also has been mainly in the city as well. Um, 
and some of the details actually uh, some of the videos i've moved into the resource section so they are resources that you can check out later on um but i will caution you that some of them are some of the details in in at one of the videos in particular are pretty upsetting um so just take care of yourself if you need to um you know kind of step away for a minute feel free to do that totally understandable a lot of information that i'm going to try to share today and then before we get into it i just kind of wanted to start with my inspiration like i mentioned my um the work that i've been doing um in domestic violence and other kinds of uh traumas um hasn't been very long um but i grew up um with some really strong uh mentors in my family um, and some of those mentors are my Hopi great grandmother. Um, she was fortunate enough to work with a woman when she was in her 60s, um, writing a book about her life. And so in our family, we actually have a written document that talks about some of the trauma that my great grandmother went through, um, including being taken from her village and being sent to boarding school when she was about eight years old. Um, the middle picture is my grandmother on the on the Ute side, um, and my Ute grandmother um, also was a Head Start teacher. She was a tribal judge. She was a um, on the business committee. This picture is from, um, one of the pictures when she was on the business committee. Um, she's a very small woman, but very powerful woman. And then on the far side is um, a picture of my mother and my nephew um, and my brother in the back. And um, this is kind of what helps me to do my work today. My parents, uh, although we were raised in the city, kept us really connected to our culture, really um, uh, impressed upon us the importance of who we were um, and that we should be proud of our heritage being Native American. I grew up in Utah, I went to high school in Utah County. Um, and so there weren't a lot of other Native Americans uh, either in our neighborhood, in the city, in our schools. Um, and so my parents knew that it was important for us to know where we came from. All right. And then throughout the um, presentation, um, this is an artist that I really love. His name is Greg Deal. Um, he actually grew up in Park City, but now lives um, in Colorado. And a lot of his work really talks about the strength of our people. Um, he talks a lot about the political issues that, that Native Americans deal with. And so you'll see a lot of um, his pieces that I really like. And this one um, was one of the first ones that I saw of his work that I really, really, that really spoke to me that for a lot of Native people, our existence, just being able to kind of live our lives and being around this long um, is a piece of the protest that, that we, we engage in. Okay. All right, so just jumping into um, the presentation, we're gonna talk a little bit about what does the problem look like in Indian country. Um, and so this representation, this map um, kind of shows where native populations and communities, where their traditional lands were. Um, and I think it's kind of important to understand that you know, Native American people are not like other um, communities of color that our people were here before colonization. Um, other communities have immigrated here or were brought here. Um, but this is one of the things that makes the Native American um, uh, history unique in our country. All right. So I'm wondering if uh, people know um, how many federally recognized tribes there are in the United States. And if you have a guess or you know, you can put that in the chat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you wanna guess how many federally recognized tribes there are in the US, go ahead and type that into chat. Someone said 450 plus, a brave soul. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we got some more. Let's so, start. 450 plus. Someone start. said 80. Someone said no idea. Someone said guessing. 500. <laughs> <laughs> Someone said 574. Ooh. Anonymous guesser, that is right on. So 
574 tribes. Um, in the last year, uh, there was one tribe that was um, that was recognized. Um, it usually takes an act of Congress to um, have a tribe be federally recognized. So there are def there are tribes that are um, in existence but are not federally recognized, and there are also tribes um, throughout the country that are state recognized but are not recognized by the federal government. And that conversation could be a whole nother hour and a half. So in Utah, there are eight federally recognized tribes. Um, and this map is um, from the Utah Division of Indian Affairs. Um, and so the parts in the red show where the tribal land is um, in our state. Um, so you kind of see up at the top is the Northwestern Band of Shoshone. They actually don't have a reservation in Utah, but they do have um, tribal headquarters <coughs> up in Logan. <clears throat> and then um, on the Western border, we've got the Skull Valley Band of Ghost Shoots and also the Confederated Band of Ghost Shoots that is right on the border. The Skull Valley Band is a little bit closer to Tooele. On the Eastern side of the state, we have the um, Uinta and Ore Reservation. This is the Ute tribe. Um, and then kind of scattered through it, Millard, Beaver, Paiute, Iron, and Washington County um, are the, uh, the Paiute band, the Paiute tri Indian tribe. So they're, all their different bands are located in, in different areas. And then down in the Four Corners area, we have the White Mesa Utes, we've got the Navajo Nation, and the San Juan Southern Paiute. So they don't have reservation land, but there's a little community right there their reservation land is in Arizona. Okay. And then I also just wanted to include this map of Utah. I thought it was really interesting to kind of show um, in 1846, what our state looked like. And so these were all the tribal um, groups that were um, in Utah and the surrounding states. And it, it, it really impressed me because there are not really a lot of, um, maps that kind of show what the tribal, who the tribal people were that lived in the area that we live in now. Okay, so um, I wanted to just kind of include a little bit of census data because, um, you know, depending on where you are working or living, um, you may not necessarily have a lot of native clients, but you might. Um, and then it also really varies across the state where um, Native people are located. So this is older information. It'll be really interesting to see what the census information looks like this year because there's been a really big push in Indian country for Native Americans to participate in the census this year. Um, and so we know, you know, that we got some really great information from the census 10 years ago. Um, and one of the really interesting things that came out of that was that um, there are a lot of Native American people that live in the city now. Um, and so it'll be interesting to see what those numbers look like. In the last census, it was also really difficult at times to cre uh, to gather that information from the reservation. Um, you know, the enumerators were not always able to go out to all the houses on the reservation. Um, this year, there was a big push to use technology. Um, using uh, the website to complete the census and um, not, you know, one of the things that came out of um, the pandemic is that not everybody has access to the technology to be able to get online or to, um, you know, get onto the internet. So the total population, so these are just the numbers here that we'll just kind of go, that I'll just post up here. And some of the state or some of the counties where we see um, what the census data showed, shows that the population looks kind of like what we see across the country, uh, between one and a half, almost 2%, I think is what um, the Native American population is overall. So Salt Lake County kind of represents that. San Juan County, however, does not represent that 2%. 49.9% uh, of people identified um, as American Indian or Alaska Native alone in San Juan County in the last census. And those, those numbers are just for people who identify solely as American Indian. You can on the census also um, identify as you know, mixed race or more than one population. When we look at those numbers in the census, the um, number of people that self-identify as Native American goes up. 
in New Winter County, um, out by the Ute Indian Tribe, it's about 7.7%. Uh, Box Elder County, again, 1.1%, and Tooele, 1.2%. Um, and then I didn't actually get all those numbers for that. Um, Andy, I don't think that this video, I can actually play from this, but we'll see. Um, okay, so pause it really quick and then go into your, um, your Zoom settings um, at the top and then you know the three dot drop down menu um, on the right hand side. If you yes. go down and share my computer audio. It doesn't have that option. Hmm. It has mute my audio. Hmm. Let's see if I have any controls here. All right. Hmm, dang. Is there any other audio settings that, you, that appear on that? Mm -mm. The menu? only thing it has, well, let's see, hold on. Yep, there we go. Okay, okay. now let's try it again. Okay. The stories of American Indians and Alaska Natives are as varied and nuanced as the So um, I really like that video. And um, because it really kind of backs up a lot of what I was seeing in the work that I was doing, um, you know, before the numbers, there weren't really great numbers about the um, impact of violence against Native people. Um, and sometimes some of the numbers that we did see in the past when I first started doing this work didn't really reflect what I was seeing in the work that I was doing. And so... Um, this report really kind of showed the the level of seriousness um, and the level of violence that was happening against Native people. So now that the problem has been kind of opened up a little bit more and identified a little bit more, I think it helps to be able to figure out, okay, what do we do next, right? So some of the things that they pulled, they talked about um, is that more than four in five Native American women have experienced violence in their lifetime. Uh, more than half of Native women have experienced sexual violence in their lifetime. Um, and more than half of all Native women have experienced physical violence by intimate partners in their lifetime. Um, and one of the things that I think we're seeing probably across the board, not just with Native American people, but that almost half of Native women have been stalked in their lifetime. When I first started doing this work, we didn't really hear, you know, we would talk about stalking and what that, lo that looked like, but I didn't really hear a lot of that actually happening. And it's become more and more common to hear um, people talk about the ways that they've been stopped. All right, Native American women are 1.7 times more likely than white women to have experienced violence in the past year. Um, and they're murdered at 10 times the national average of some countries. So, um, you know, not only do Native women experience violence at higher rates than, than many other populations, but they're also losing their lives um, at higher rates. Um, Native women are almost two times as likely to have experienced rape um, as non-Hispanic white women uh, over the course of their lifetime. And then again, the, the murder rate of Native women is almost three times that of non-Hispanic white women. All right. Um, I also wanted to include um, some uh, resources throughout here. And this one is a great one. If you're looking for information um, both about the problem uh, for Native Americans um, and also really great resources to give out. This is a flyer, um, a little brochure actually that um, uh, that comes from Native Hope and the website's right there. Um, this, this flyer in particular talks a little bit about sexual assault statistics for Native American women. Um, so really is this organization is really helping to, um, you know, do a lot of educating about what, what the problems might look like in our communities. Um, hang on one second. I need to plug in my computer. It just said my battery is going to die.
All right, sorry about that. All right, so we're gonna move on into the next section. And um, I just wanted to start this section with this picture that I think is really beautiful. Um, you don't really, it's not very common to see um, pictures of two men together um, in their traditional regalia. And so it's a picture that I really love um, and I include it in most of my presentations. Um, so I wanted to kind of talk a little bit about um, native two spirits. The term two spirit um, was adopted in 1990 at a spiritual gathering of lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender natives. Um, it's a term that provides a moniker for native sexual or gender minorities um, that actually includes and validates um, both culture and then a culturally distinct sexual and gender identity. A lot of native communities um, don't only do not only recognize um, a binary um, gender having male and female. Um, and while traditionally there are specific roles for um, different identities, um, in some communities, it's not just a male or female that defines um, you know, the roles that people have. Um, however, the term two-spirit, like most identifiers, not everybody uses this term. Um, it's also become somewhat of an umbrella term to include um, LGBTQ um, identities, but traditionally the, the, it, it has been um, understood as, I, dis, as discussing gender and not necessarily sexuality. Um, but it's evolved over time for sure. Um, and I think it's really, people have really um, adopted it and used it because it recognizes both our cultural identity and also um, sexual or gender um, identity as well. So there's not a lot of um, research about um, uh, two-spirited people. And so that is one place where the research and the education and discussion really needs to expand. Um, but there are a couple of research studies that I thought kind of highlighted the issue. Um, and we know in, in the mainstream community, um, people that identify as transgender um, or LGBTQ do also face um, you know, multiple intersections. Um, of abuse um, and that that is similar um, among the two-spirit population. So um, a 2014 study of 152 sexual minority American Indian and Alaska Native women uh, reported, and this comes from the, the um, report, a disturbingly high prevalence of both sexual and physical assault. So 85% of the participants reported they'd been physically assaulted and 78% or sorry, sexually assaulted and 78 reported they'd been physically assaulted. And then a 2006 study, um, it was a very small sample showed uh, of 71 gay, bisexual, and two-spirit men were more likely than their heterosexual counterparts to report being sexually and physically victimized. 10% um, of that study reported sexual abuse or assault by a partner, um, but 45% reported that they were abused by someone other um, than a spouse or a sexual partner. So some of the things that we can kind of see from those research, I did, I took some time to kind of take a look at, you know, what could I find on the report uh, in the research and, and there wasn't a lot. And so that, that is what one of the reports indicated that there's not a lot of data that represents accurate rates of domestic and sexual violence in the two-spirit um, community. I think anecdotally, we hear it a lot, but there's not a lot of research, right? And a lot of the studies have really, really small sample sizes. Usually it's a convenient sample. So if someone's providing services, you know, they're able to do kind of talk to their clients about what they're experiencing. Um, some of the other stuff that comes out of the research that two-spirit women face stigma regarding their sexual orientation, both from the wider society, from other native people, from their families and their tribal communities. And then they also face racism from the wider society, from other sexual minorities, and sexism from both the native and the LGBTQ community. So despite that increased risk, one of the reports really talked about how public health and psychology research has largely ignored two-spirit people. And that is something that needs to change if we're going to change those conditions. So one of the things you know, that other kinds of research really shows is that violence against Native women and Native people has a lot of intersecting contributors. 
And some of those things include colonization, um, racism, stereotypes, and sexualization of Native people, um, historical trauma. All right. So colonization, if that's not a term that you're familiar with, colonization, this is actually just the dic a dictionary um, definition. And uh, so they define colonization as the action or process of settling among and establishing control over the indigenous people of an area. Um, and it gives the example that Africa boasts a tradition of higher education institutions that predate Western colonization. So, you know, the United States is not the only country that's been colonized. Colonization is a global issue. Um, and the effects of coloniz colonization affects a lot of people. Um, so like I mentioned in the beginning, because there were Native Americans here uh, before colonization, the effects of colonization really um, are profound in Native communities um, and have been one of the contemporarily one of the um, populations that they have studied um, the effects of colonization the most. Right. So I just want to give an example of colonization from, uh, you know, something that most people are familiar with. Um, so most of us know or are familiar with Pocahontas, at least her name, right? And so this is a photo of her after colonization. So after um, the uh, after, after the white man came to her people, um, she did go back to England um, with a group of people. And so this is a, a painting of her. Uh, but most of us are familiar with this version of Pocahontas, right? So some of the information about Pocahontas, who she really was, she was 13 years, when she was 13 years old, she was kidnapped by colonizers and she was offered for ransom. And when the ransom wasn't satisfied, she remained with the English. And so it's not really clear whether or not it was her choice to stay with the English. Um, Pocahontas is not a Disney fairy tale or a movie. Um, the legend that she saved John Smith is likely not even true. She was 10 years old when John Smith met her. And there's a lot of controversy over whether or not John Smith was telling the truth about the story that he told. Um, Pocahontas died when she was 21 years old. Um, she is not a colonizer's fantasy of a native woman. She's not a costume. We'll talk more about that in a few minutes. Uh, she's not a joke, nor should her name or person be used in attacks against other women. Um, her real name was Macho Aka. I'm not exactly sure if that's her, the pronunciation. Um, she was the daughter of Powhatan and her mother's name was Pocahontas. Um, and all of this information I got from the Smithsonian. Um, so the links are in the presentation if you want to check it out and find out some more information. Um, there's a really great documentary that the Smithsonian helped produce that talks about, you know, the story of Pocahontas. Um, I think that's the link for the, either the story or there's a link for the, the documentary as well. Okay. So I'm not sure how familiar people um, are with historical trauma. I guess if you've heard the term or know what it is, um, you can raise your hand. All right, we have a couple folks who are raising their hand. Oh, good. Yep, more people are. Awesome. When I first started doing these kinds of presentations, not a lot of people had heard about historical trauma. So I think it's really um, encouraging that more people um, have heard or have an understanding of what historical trauma was because historical trauma affects most people, um, but a lot of different communities um, have historical trauma in their background. Um, and in general, historical trauma is most easily described as multi-generational trauma experienced by a specific cultural group. So the trauma that is inflicted on a group happens because of their identity in that group. And it can be experienced by anyone living in families who at one time were marked by severe levels of trauma, things like poverty, um, it says dislocation, um, war, um, and who are still suffering as a result. So. I think that uh, taking a look at where the research goes will be really interesting. There's been a lot of um, 
uh, refugees in the last uh, decade, maybe. I mean, there have been refugees before that, but I think there was a lot of instability um, globally. And so um, it'll be interesting to see if if the refugee community, if how the research comes. Yeah, because traditionally the research has been, the research began with Holocaust survivors. There's also been studies looking at African-American population and a lot of research done in the Native American population. All right, so this is a picture of a boarding school and uh, for Native Americans, boarding schools are a huge source of historical trauma. Almost every Native person that you meet will have some stories about how boarding school has affected their family. And boarding schools were kind of set up to be like military schools. Um, and this is how Native American children were taught, not only um, given their education, but taught how to be Americans. Um, this quote is from Dr. Maria Yellow Horse Braveheart. She's a Lakota researcher who, this is what she focuses on. She focuses on not only on historical trauma, but also healing from historical trauma in Native communities. And her definition um, that I really love um, because it really feels more descriptive than other um, descriptions that I've seen, other definitions. Um, historical trauma is cumulative emotional and psychological wounding over the lifespan and across generations emanating from massive group trauma. And I think, um, you know, for Native American people, storytelling is a huge part of how we um, come to know how to be, um, how we share our history and our knowledge. And so I think that her definition really encompasses, um, you know, that kind of storytelling. So uh, this, you know, kind of my view of historical trauma, this is why I think historical trauma is relevant both personally and professionally in the work that I've done. Um, historical trauma as a collective phenomenon um, kind of shows that those people that didn't experience the initial traumatic stressor or the stressors that get handed down because there's usually more than one thing. Um, that's one of the things that I've kind of been looking into this year and kind of seeing what the research shows that a lot of the communities where we study historical trauma, there's one incident, but for Native Americans, there are cumulative incidences over generations that have been traumatic that get passed down. Um, so those children and descendants can still exhibit signs and symptoms of trauma. Um, and, you know, some things to keep in mind that our clients' reactions to stressful situations, to authority figures, to institutional settings, to hospitals, to law enforcement, things like that can have roots in survival from historical genocide. Um, Native Americans have histories of trauma that are related to our homelands, to boarding schools, to tribal citizenship, to removal of our children, medical procedures, discrimination, assault and murder by outsiders and law enforcement. So a lot of the things that we look at in the mainstream community as helpers or um, as uh, you know, positives are not always positives or have not always helped Native Americans. And so sometimes the reaction that people have um, is a little bit deeper than just being resistant or not understanding um, that there are historical roots in people's reactions. So historical trauma is not an excuse, um, but rather it's an explanation of circumstances that were unique for certain populations. And knowing about historical trauma may help the helpers understand why people act or react in certain ways. All right. So like I mentioned, um, you know, most Native American people have a story about boarding school. I just wanted to kind of show you um, a picture of my great grandmother again, and this is her book. It's called Me and Mine, The Life Story of Helen Sika Kwaptua. So, um, and in there she talks, she writes a lot about um, not only what, you know, the traumatic things that happened to her, but also tells the story of growing up as a Hopi woman, um, you know, what it was like when she was born and the ceremonies and the rituals that happened um, that created who she was. So I like to share that. There's a couple of resources that are also included in here. There's a, a link here to a 2018 um, University of Utah Chronicle article. Um, and that's the daily paper at the university. 
And um, I thought this was a really great little um, kind of letter to the editor that kind of talked about, you know, Utah needs to acknowledge its treatment of American Indians. I grew up here in the, in mostly in Utah. And I know that, you know, in my experience going to junior high and high school, there wasn't a lot of discussion about the Indians that were here. Um, there was definitely more discussion about how Utah became a state and when the pioneers came here too. So it, this is a really, it's a good read. It's a really brief read that kind of talks a little bit about the people that were here and honoring the people that were here before. All right. And then um, I also included this uh, quote as well when we talk about um, historical trauma and kind of the intersection between uh, racism. This is uh, a quote from the Minnesota Indian Women's Resource Center, which um, is an organization that um, addresses domestic violence and sexual assault in Minnesota. Um, and what they have, this quote describes is ongoing race experiences with racism lead to what have been termed colonial trauma response, which results when a native woman experiences a current event that connects her to a collective historical sense of injustice and trauma. So just as people uh, with post-traumatic stress disorder get triggered to relive traumatic events they've experienced, American Indian women who have endured massive trauma and injustice historically are triggered to connect current experiences uh, with racism, abuse, um, and or injustice with those experienced by their female ancestors in a very immediate and emotional way. So a Native woman's response to the situation is not only based on her own experiences, but on the experiences of generations of her female ancestors. So again, just another kind of explanation about the way that historical trauma can in fact impact people having uh, traumatic experiences right now. Um, so I want to talk just a little bit about stereotypes. It's kind of, uh, you know, has, has gotten a little bit more um, uh, mainstream attention um, in the last year or so, but I really like this little cartoon because it kind of explain, you know, puts it all in a nutshell. We've got two people here walking um, and one of the people says, really, you don't look like an Indian. Um, and as we look in the thought bubble, um, all of that person's perceptions of what a Native American person looked like are these different stereotypes that, that he's grown up with. All right, and again, this is another piece of um, a work by Greg Deal. Um, what, he used to live in Washington, DC. And so, um, you know, over time there have been definitely um, movements to change the name of the, the Washington um, football team. And so, you know, he, he, this piece of art really talks about how a lot of the slurs that were common um, historically for other communities are not used anymore. That we've come to recognize that these terms are hurtful um, or derogatory, um, except for this last term that recognize, that is um, references Native Americans. And so amazingly, you know, in the last year, the team has actually kind of come around to saying that, yes, we're going to change the name, which the owner had always said he wasn't going to. So I think that he, he's, Greg Deal has kind of posted a little bit about how, he, how he's felt about that since he was so involved in that movement. All right. One of the other things that, you know, I think kind of feeds into the, um, you know, the high rates of, of um, violence against Native American women in particular is this sexualization um, of Native women. So here we have an image um, of these girls not wearing very many clothing, but also having like the feathers and these ones don't have paint, but that often happens as well. So these kind of representations just get kind of normalized in our society and sometimes feed into the way that people think about um, Native American women. Every Halloween, we're right in that period of time where every Halloween store has um, these kinds of costumes that you can purchase. All right. Some of the other intersecting um, uh, uh, things that kind of affect the rates of violence against women as well are things like poverty. So in the 2015 census data, the update kind of showed that the median income for American Indians and Alaska Natives was significantly lower um, than the United States as a whole. Um, 
and that the poverty rates were higher um, for people who identified as Alaska, uh, American Indian or Alaska Native. Um, and at the time in 2015, um, the number of people of American Indians that did not have health insurance um, was almost double the mainstream population. Um, and then this also shows that home ownership rates a little bit lower than the mainstream population um, and education rates, although um, rates of high school diploma, GED or certificate were similar, 82.7 versus 87, rates of bachelor degrees um, were definitely, were about half of what the mainstream population is. And one of the things that we know is that, you know, rates of education definitely affect how people, um, you know, that it, it's an intersecting factor in, in violence. All right, I think I'm gonna skip <clears throat> through this a little bit. Um, the video kind of talked a little bit about, uh, you know, kind of the need for services and <clears throat> with sexual assault, um, you know, again, the numbers are really high um, among Native American um, clients. And sometimes those services are not always um, available. Um, it's more common to, to have a little bit more trouble on the reservation linking to services. But even in the city, it's sometimes hard to figure out how those services are going to be accessed, um, where to go when people need help. Um, and that's one of the things that I've seen in the work that we do at the Urban Indian Center as well. Um, they kind of mentioned in the video that legal medical and support services, they vary depending on where Native American um, survivors live. Um, what services you can access also the, uh, varies on depending on where the assault occurred and who the perpetrator was. Um, for Native, American, uh, Native Americans who live on reservation, Indian health services provide health care in 36 states, um, but that's only 36 states across the country. And we know from the census that um, Native Americans live probably in every state in the country, right? Um, as of uh, April 2017, there were 26 uh, Indian Health Service hospitals, 59 health centers, 32 health stations, and 33 urban Indian health projects in the IHS. Uh, my agency is an urban Indian health project, and up until uh, this last year, we did not have an on-site medical provider. In the last year, we've been able to add uh, nurse practitioners onto our site, so that has definitely increased uh, the medical um, resources that Native American people are able to access in the city. Um, and then again, you know, there's a significant portion of American Indian and Alaska Natives um, that don't have medical insurance, uh, you know, compared to, to overall. So one of the things that the videos have kind of talked about or kind of mentioned is that um, when it comes to who is perpetrating violence against Native American women in particular, um, that the vast majority of victims of sexual violence, their perpetrators are non-Native. Um, and 21% uh, of Native American women have experienced interracial violence. Uh, Native American women are five times as likely to have experienced physical violence by an interracial intimate partner. And more than four in five Native women, so 89% have experienced stalking by a non-Native perpetrator. So oftentimes people feel, you know, people may have the perception that um, the violence that's being perpetrated against Native American women in particular is by Native American people, but it's not. Overwhelmingly, it's non-Native perpetrators. Um, on the reservation, one of the things that we deal with is, is jurisdiction. So in the city, if a crime happens, then wherever that crime happened, that's the jurisdiction that's going to do the investigation, going to take a look at whether or not it goes to court. When we go onto the reservation land, that changes things a little bit. So this is a little bit older report. Um, so all of the, the tribes um, are considered sovereign and they have a formal nation to nation relationship with the US government. Um, these, uh, this sovereignty is a, one of the treaty rights. Um, and so uh, tribal governments are legally defined as federally recognized tribes. So at that time, 229, of the tribal nations were located in Alaska. The remaining tribes were located 
in 35 other states. So in total, tribal governments exercise jurisdiction over land that would make Indian country the fourth largest state in the nation. So sovereignty is a legal word for an ordinary concept. Um, sovereignty gives a, um, a group the authority to self-govern. So tribal nations ceded millions of acres of land that made the US what it is today. And in return, they receive the guarantee of ongoing self-government on their own land. So like I mentioned, depending on where and what kind of assault or abuse was committed, that determines who has jurisdiction. So in urban areas or off reservation, the jurisdiction is the same for non-native abusers, uh, but on or near the reservation is kind of where things get a little tricky. Um, so in 2013, uh, VAWA, the Violence Against Women Act, gave tribes the ability to exercise sovereign power to investigate, prosecute, convict, and sentence both Indians and non-Indians who assault Indian spouses or dating partners, or who violated a protective order in Indian country. Um, it also gave um, tribes the, the ability to issue and enforce civil protective orders against Indian and non-Indians. And before that, um, tribes were not able to prosecute non-Native perpetrators. So this law went into effect about March 2015. Um, so at that point, tribes were given the ability to criminally prosecute non-Indian domestic violence abusers. Um, however, not every tribe does this. It does take a lot of resources um, to be able to, to set up um, this system. And so in the tribal um, areas where the tribe has chosen not to move forward to prosecute non-Native um, perpetrators, then the U.S. attorney or the state or local prosecutor, whoever has jurisdiction, they will continue to prosecute crimes in Indian country. All right, so after uh, VAWA 2013 was implemented, um, between 2015 and 2018, 18 tribes um, had arrested non-Indian perpetrators and 128 different non-Native perpetrators were arrested 143 times. So just like in the mainstream community, we have people who are you know, committing crimes more than once. Um, and as of March, 2018, uh, in the tribal courts, there were 74 convictions and five acquittals. So again, still, still difficult to, um, you know, go through an entire investigation and take it to trial, um, both, you know, on the reservation and off the reservation. So VAWA 13 really only allows for tribal courts to prosecute a very small set of crimes. Um, and those crimes don't include crimes against children, law enforcement, or sexual assault by a stranger. So it really was very narrow, kind of focused on domestic violence. Um, when, we, when I created this, I was way more optimistic about 2018, VAWA 2018, but VAWA 2018 still has not been reauthorized. So VAWA 2018, um, when it was proposed, intended <clears throat> to... Um, kind of expand tribal jurisdiction um, and kind of expand the crimes that tri uh, tribal courts could uh, prosecute. Uh, and also take a look at um, how domestic violence affects children, right? Because um, what we know about um, domestic violence and, and survivors of domestic violence, many of them are children, right? Uh, and then um, other crimes that non-native perpetrators um, may commit it during domestic violence are still not able to be prosecuted by the tribal courts. So 2018 so hasn't been, so I'm not going to get too much into it. Um, but uh, one of the things that they were looking at as well in 2018 was improving data collection and having a response to missing and murdered women. Although VAWA 2018 did not get reauthorized yet, um, some of these things actually have happened recently. And so there are, uh, the federal government has moved to try to take a look at how, how does federally do we need to respond to this problem of missing and murdered women in our country. And Utah actually also recently established a missing and murdered indigenous women and girls task force as well. Um, their first meeting was in October. There will be two more meetings um, in November to kind of collect some stories and kind of give the opportunity for community members to talk about how this issue has affected 
um, both individual and tribal communities. So, and then 2018 will also create federal punishments for violating tribal exclusion orders. So in some tribes, um, it is possible to be able to um, banish uh, tribal members from a tribal community. Okay, I'm going to start, but if you have a chance to watch this video um, in the presentation, it's a really great uh, video kind of talking. Deb Holland talks a little bit about why we need to pay attention to violence against Native women, especially it, when it comes to missing and murdered Indigenous women. So, um, some of the reasons why MMIW has become uh, kind of a, a topic that people are being able to uh, hear more about is because of this idea of human trafficking. And human trafficking, although it's been very common uh, in Indian country, not a lot of people were talking about it outside of the, the people that were being affected by human trafficking. So a little bit of the research that I did about human trafficking in general, um, a lot of the things were kind of surprising for me. Um, human trafficking only became a crime recently. In 2000, the U.S. was the first country to criminalize human trafficking under the Trafficking Victims Protection Act. So human trafficking is described as the recruitment, harboring, transportation, provision, obtaining, patronizing, or soliciting of a person for the purpose of a commercial sex act. Um, and that was what trafficking looked like in 2000. We now know that people are trafficked you know, for more than just uh, sex trafficking, um, but the mechanisms are kind of are similar um, with trafficking, depending on what the intent is going to be. Um, it's not always easy to recognize, but what we know is that female victims generally share similar risk factors, including poverty, poor education, and inequality. Um, and so that those things put Native American women in particular at high risk to be trafficked. There are high rates of poverty, um, uh, intimate partner violence, family violence, sexual abuse, and assault um, in Indian country. Native American women are trafficked far more frequently than other racial groups in the US and they experience staggering levels of unreported sexual violence. Um, and because of the historic relationship between Native Americans and the federal government, Native Americans um, are generally distrustful of federal and state justice systems. Um, and so oftentimes, and I think this is across the board with trafficking victims, but definitely among Native Americans, they may not choose to identify themselves as being trafficked. They may not want to get involved uh, with the legal system. And then again, jurisdiction issues play a significant role in the relationship between states and tribes. Uh, many variables determine which court has jurisdiction over crimes committed on tribal land. And this often leads to difficulties and confusion for everyone in investigation, in prosecution. Um, so, you know, trafficking is really something where uh, we're really looking at figuring out how to kind of prevent it, how do we address it, how do we, you know, try to end it. Um, and then again, like I said, this link, there's a, a letter here that I think is very powerful that talks um, uh, about Native Hope, again, that organization that I mentioned earlier. Um, they, she wrote a letter for them that kind of talked about her experience and how once um, she was able to get taken out of trafficking and start the healing process, a huge part of how she was trying to heal was reconnecting with her culture. And that was not something, having a connection with her culture or her spirituality was not something that she was able to access while she was being trafficked. So this became a huge piece of her healing. And she wrote a, a, a very powerful letter talking about what that looks like. And the link is on the bottom of that, right? So, you know, about 2018 is kind of where um, this attention started to be paid about uh, missing and murdered women. So these are some of the headlines that we found, you know, between 2018 and 2019. And I think a lot of it had to do um, with the movie Wind River. Wind River was the first like national um, uh movie or, you know, something that everybody was able to access that really talked about what the MMIW um, uh, problem looks like. So also, I, I think in 2018, yes, this, um, this report was published. 
Um, and it is a snapshot of data from 71 urban cities in the United States. So a lot of focus because the federal government has jurisdiction on the reservation. A lot of attention has been focused on the reservation about MMIW, uh, but there wasn't a lot of good information about what that looked like in the city. And so this report that came out in 2018 um, was kind of um, a big deal in Indian country, right? So what it showed, it was the top 10 states where women were um, missing or murdered. And so the top 10 states were New Mexico, Washington, Arizona, Montana, California, Nebraska, Utah, Minnesota, Oklahoma. Um, and so I think that in Utah, this was kind of surprising that, you know, Salt Lake City was among the top 10 states where um, Native American women were missing and murdered. One of the other outcomes that came out of that report is that, and that came out of Wind River, is that this was not something that was documented by law enforcement before. There were not really good statistics about missing and murdered Indigenous women. So in Salt Lake, after that report came out, there was a lot of um, headlines and a lot of stories about that as well. So these are some of the headlines that we saw in Salt Lake City. And that media attention and then the subsequent police response, it kind of highlighted a couple of things that this is an issue that people want to bring attention to, um, that there was not really great data classification um, to indicate how big the problem was or how small the problem was. Um, and there was really a lack of transparent communication uh, among all the parties about what this problem actually looked like and what the response looks like. So the Salt Lake City Police Department actually did um, put out a statement after the, the um, report was published. And what kind of what they said was that, you know, they didn't feel like the data was very, um, very well classified and that there was a lot of inconsistency in documenting and reporting. So. One of the other issues about uh, missing women as well, especially when they're adults, is it's very difficult to um, kind of understand what's happening with adults who disappear. Um, because as an adult, um, if you're missing, uh, you know, you, you have the right to take off from your family and friends and things like that. So that also complicates what that looks like. All right. And so I, um, I think this will be my last slide. The presentation does have some other resources, but I did want to end um, on this slide that kind of represented when we talk about Native American issues, um, you know, the perception can be that, you know, things are all bad and they're not, you know, for me, growing up as a Native American and being able to grow up in my culture and see the beauty in our people. I think that's, this is the image that I want to leave people with. So. so if anybody has any questions, I can definitely answer them or. Yeah, does anyone have any questions? Um, you can type them into chat. Um, you can also use that Q&A feature. This, so at the end of the presentation, there's some local Native American resources. So our agency's here, there's a tribal coalition. Um, Utah Navajo Health Systems is on here. There's some national resources before I get to my slide um, that have some great information about, uh, you know, Native American issues. And then my contact information is right here. Maybe, hold on. Yeah, right here. So my phone number is there or my email is there. So on the presentation, um, feel free to, you know, if you have questions or, you know, want to know a little bit more information or need some more resources, feel free to reach out and either email me or give me a call. And um, you can also reach out, reach out to me if for some reason you, you forget, um, you know, Christina's contact information or anything and I can link you with her. And we just got a question. Can you mm -hmm. talk about can you talk about how we as providers can provide inclusive and accessible outreach? Um, what, can, clarify, can you tell me a little bit more about what you mean by outreach? If the, the person who asked the question, could you submit another question with that? 
clarifying information or even type it into chat. <laughs> That's a good question though. So what, a good question. what do you mean by outreach? Just about services or resources or is it something in particular? Okay, um, it says I'll th think more about my question and reach out directly. <laughs> okay. I mean, I think, you know, in a lot of places, the help that's available for Native American clients is going to be from non-Native people, right? And so I think that anytime you're working with, um, you know, communities or individuals that are different from you, it's important to think about, um, you know, how do we show that we are non-judgmental and that we are open to hearing people's stories and things like that. And so, one of the things to think about is that, you know, Native American communities are really used to people bringing resource, bringing flyers, bringing brochures and information, and then not really, and then disappearing. And I think that's one thing that's really important in any community is showing that you're, you're going to be there for the community. So in Native communities, and I don't know what things look like now, like my advice I'm not exactly sure what my advice would be now, because in a normal world, in the world before COVID, um, there are often like activities and, you know, social gatherings and things like that, that you could, you know, be present at, not only as a service provider, but as a member of the community. Um, in the last year, all of those kind of gathering activities that are really important to our communities have been kind of shut down. So that's really hard. Um, but being able to, you know, access, you know, schools or um, tribal offices or things like that and providing information, making sure that you're accessible, um, making sure people know who you are, those are ways to, um, you know, show that community that you're committed to helping that community. So being more present, being, being available. One of the things that has been very beneficial for me in my work is that I've been at the agency for a really long time before I, you know, when I very first started working at my agency, there were some people, especially um, in the behavioral health program that weren't really there for a long time. And so me being here and people being able to call me a year, two years, you know, five years down the road um, has really been beneficial for people reaching out. And I'm always around talking about the work that we do at our agency and the ways that we can help people. Excellent. Um, if anyone else has a last minute question, um, we can get that answered before we um, end today's webinar. I'll wait here for just a minute. And of course, if you have any questions that you would like further information on or more specific questions, you can reach out to Christina or you could reach out to me and we can get you connected. All right, Christina, it looks like your presentation answered all the questions that they had. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> yeah, always, a, always a good thing, always a good thing. Yeah. So, so thank you. Thank you so much, Christina, for being here. Um, I can't wait for the day to see you in person again. Um, I know, me too. <laughs> you're the best, you're the best. <laughs> I definitely miss you, friend. Um, so thank you everyone for, connecting and learning with us, asking questions, participating, really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Um, I hope you have an excellent day, excellent week. Um, yeah, so we'll see you next time. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.